right, 810, the number of things uh, that mark the month of October, and uh, one of them is Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And uh, as she was last year at this time, back with us uh, to talk about that is Jennifer Fatma of Safe Place. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for the time. Today. Yes, thanks for having us on. Let's remind folks what Safe Place is all about. Yeah, Safe Place is um, our county's domestic violence organization. So we have a shelter here as well as provide non-residential services. And we're the only one in our community. Boy, um, you know, when you think about uh, the work you do and the challenge that's involved in that, Boy, and there's only one organization that does all that work. Uh, that must keep you moving. It does keep us busy. And unfortunately, we are one of the state's largest and busiest shelters here in Battle Creek. Really? Mm -hmm. So we presume that means that you are the largest and busiest because the demand is there. The demand is there. And, and last month, just last month, on our crisis line, we had 101 people that we had to say our shelter is full oh and we God. have 56 beds so the demand is not just there but uh we, we struggle to meet it it's more than there yes yeah so what happens in those cases what, what happens next do you make a recommendation a referral oh absolutely yeah. because we're the only ones we never just say if someone calls and says do you have a bed we would never just say no our response is always are you safe because if someone's not safe we bring them in get them a cup of coffee, glass of water, and we figure it out from there. Oh, we have wow. couches. Um, we have Murphy beds. We have agreements with sister shelters throughout the state. So there's a lot of things we can do, whether someone can stay with us or not. We can still help keep them safe. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, then, um, when you figure it out, it means they're probably being relocated somewhere. Sometimes, yep. Sometimes just a night or two, uh, you know, on a sofa or on a Murphy bed will help them figure out where they need to go. It's, uh, it's quiet. It's safe. They can think. Um, maybe they have a sister in another town or a mom. We need to get them a bus ticket to go to. But it at least gives them a couple days. And if it needs to be longer than that, then we figure that out, too, because people are coming and going all the time. So mm -hmm. it may be that a bed opens up in a couple days for them. Well, hence the name, Safe Place. Yeah, right? exactly. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute on WBCK. And, and obviously the demand is there, but when we talked a year ago, how does that compare? We'll talk about that coming up in just a minute on WBCK. It's time. 8.15, Jennifer Fatma's here on the Wednesday show from Safe Place as we discuss Domestic Violence Awareness Month. It's a little bit of a, uh, of a, a dose of reality to hear that, uh, that our safe place is as active as it is. Uh, how do you interpret that? Is it the problem is there and so we're responding to it or uh, we've just been so good at at building a safe place for this that it just results in folks coming here? I think it's a little of both. Okay. I think uh, certainly the problem is there, and we're responding to it. It's everywhere. Uh, we just happen to have a larger shelter, so, uh, you know, we serve more people in our shelter. But also I think we do a great job. Uh, our staff really are excellent. I would put them up against anybody across the state of Michigan. In fact, we're looked to as a model um, you know, for treatment because of, of how well we do. But I would also say that the more uh, media attention that it gets, for example, after Ray Rice, mm -hmm. you know, every shelter's numbers increased. When it becomes more acceptable to talk about and to reach out and get help when we stop victim blaming in the media, then victims do tend to reach out and say, this is happening to me too. Well, I think that's what prompted our, our talk a year ago was that whole story was prevalent at this point yep. in time. And now we've got Hardy, so almost a yeah. duplicate of what happened then. Right. So uh, how do we compare to last year? I mean, you're tracking these things, I presume. Are yeah. we? Are the numbers going up, staying the same, going down? Well, they're going up. Um, mm -hmm. We had over 11,000 nights of shelter, so we had wow. over a 40% increase in our nights of shelter. We served um, close to 2,000 people. We usually serve around 1,500. We served close to 2,000 in all of our programs last year. So the numbers are certainly there. And, you know, like I said, when we're full and we're busy, we end up putting people on couches, where before we really tried to avoid that. It's uh, not how you want to treat a crime victim. But mm -hmm. when the alternative is staying with an assailant or having to leave our community, 
then we really want to do everything we can to accommodate. And even our, uh, the victims that we serve in shelter, you know, the survivors, they'll tell us, someone can room with me. You know, don't tell them no. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, they understand as well, and they want to keep, you know, our, their, their sister residents, their, you know, their neighbors safe as well. Better than anyone they understand. Exactly. Probably. Yeah. So, um, boy, that's disheartening to hear. 40% increase one year to the next? Yes, yep. And oh it was gosh. like that the year before as well. So. Wow. What constitutes domestic violence by definition? Does it have to be physical? No. In fact, unfortunately, sometimes the first physical act of violence is a murder. Um, but oh it's it's fear. We have an expression, scared to stay, afraid to leave. This isn't about an argument between couples or an unhealthy relationship. This really is about fear. Someone um, controlling another person, not allowing them to make decisions, and somebody living in fear. In fact, uh, we don't have a lot of rules in our shelter. In fact, we have very few because one of the things assailants do is take away a person's power. So it's our job to give that back. Now, um, 10 years ago, when the philosophy was different, you could take a white glove and everything would be clean. Hmm. But what we realized is, in fact, we had a a victim not long ago, and if she, she had to clean the floor, scrub them clean. And when her assailant got home, he would pick which floor to make her lick to prove to him that she had sterilized it and cleaned it. So, you know, when chores have that kind of connotation, it's really not fair to to do that to the victims we serve. Mm -hmm. And so when you take someone in uh, that's in a situation like this, you have to be concerned for their safety and everybody around you. Absolutely, and it is the most dangerous time. When a victim leaves their assailant, their risk of lethality, their risk of being murdered increases by 75%. Not just hurt, but murdered. Murdered. By 75%. And it makes sense. This is a crime of power and control. It's not about passion. It's not about love. It's about power and control. And when they feel they've lost that, when the victim has left, that's when they become the most dangerous. How dare you leave me? Goodness. So you help these folks in these situations. And uh, and then when things calm down, they enter back into the community. And, and yeah. just think about that for a second. We're not that large of a community. Mm-hmm. So... The opportunity to encounter that person again is there, is it not? It is. And, in fact, that's a question I often get asked is, well, how many times do they come back? Mm -hmm. As if if they use our services three or four times, that means that they've done something wrong. And the reality is a lot of times they are found by their assailant. Yeah. And they're in danger again and need to come back. So really asking the, you know, us that question is the wrong question to ask. It's all the, we have to continue to put the responsibility on the assailant. The victim's done nothing wrong. Mm-hmm. And when we come back in a minute, we'll talk about why that doesn't happen in just a second on WBCK with Jennifer Fatma. 820 now, WBCK. 822 WBCK, Jennifer Fotmas here from Safe Place. We're talking about Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So, yeah, the picture you've painted is uh, the question becomes how often do you see people come back? But your point in saying that it should be the other way is the question is why aren't those assailants in jail? Yes, exactly. And sometimes they they haven't done enough. Um, For example, uh, you, if they physically hit you, you've got some evidence. If they're threatening you and you're afraid all the time, that's a little bit more difficult to prove. Right. And a lot of times our victims are terrified to testify. So I know that that's something people don't understand as well, is, oh, well, she refused to testify against him. It must not have been that bad. But that is a huge myth. Hmm. The truth is, uh, unless the victim knows that they're going to be uh, locked up and for a long time, then they may come out even more angry. Sure. So if they're in jail for a night or two or even 20 days, 30 days, they may come out even more angry and they're in more danger. So we trust that our victims know how to keep themselves safe. Um, and and whatever their decision is, in order to come to safe place, doesn't mean you have to call the police, doesn't mean you have to prosecute. Uh, our job is to help victims stay safe, mm-hmm. period. So what's the solution here? I mean, in in so far as you observe uh, the work you do, uh, what's common to try and stop this cycle? 
Well, you know, I do joke that there is a shelter available for batterers. It's called jail. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, that that we need to use that shelter more. Um, but I really think there has to be a huge shift because there still is a lot of victim blaming going on. And I think, unfortunately, domestic violence is still viewed as a woman's issue. And it really isn't, which is why, if I can put a little plug in for next Saturday, the yeah. 24th, is our Walk a Mile in Her Shoes event, which is my favorite event because it's our male allies. It's 100, 200 men coming together and saying, we know this isn't a woman's issue. We know that only 15% of, of men commit this crime, and the other 85% of us aren't going to let them represent us. Mm -hmm. So it sends such a strong message, not just to the community, um, but to survivors, to victims of domestic violence, that most men are good men. And so it is such an important event for men to come out and stand with us. And quite honestly, it's it's... Uh, does a lot for me. We have 15 FTE, 15 full-time equivalent staff serving 2,000 people in our community, open 24 hours a day. Mm -hmm. And so even for us to see all those people standing with us, it gives us, you know, a new shot in the arm of energy to say, yep, we can keep doing this. We're not alone. We have all these community members and especially all these great men standing with us saying this isn't okay. I have a sister. I have a mother. Right. I have a daughter. Um, and this isn't a woman's issue. It's a community issue. In a minute, we'll talk about uh, how folks can participate in that if they'd right. like to a week from Saturday. So, you know, it's great what you're doing uh, there as a resource for someone in trouble. Uh, what other proactive things do you think could be done to try and stop this cycle? I mean, if you're, in your case, safe place is there when people need you, and that's great. But are there things we could be doing as a community somehow that can head this behavior off? Absolutely, and we do that too. You don't have to be in our shelter. In fact, only 400 people-ish a year are in shelter. So it's really one of the smallest programs we have, but it's so important because, again, that's the most dangerous time. But one of the things we do is work on systems change. We work on prevention. So right now, in fact, um, there's an exciting program. We have an agreement with every single law enforcement agency in our county, including tribal. So mm -hmm. uh, sheriff's department, uh, city police, township police, tribal, and we are working with them so that when they go out on a call for domestic violence, they know what to look for, and they're helping victims before things escalate. So we've got a partnership with them. We're one of the few in the entire nation that has that level of partnership. Um, we're working with them to change systems to make things easier for our victims to escape, making it easier for them to stay safe. So there's a lot going on. We're talking in the schools about prevention, what a healthy relationship is. Um, most people kind of know what it feels like to not be healthy, but they don't really know what a healthy relationship looks like. Uh -huh. So we also work very, very closely with sexual assault services because often the issues of domestic violence and sexual assault are intertwined. Yeah. So we've got a lot of great things going on in our community on that prevention and education end as well. I think the biggest issue, though, really is just making sure that we're keeping the responsibility on assailants and stop the victim blaming. That really is kind of, you know, my platform. We don't want to talk about things in the paper like it was an argument about hot dogs, which I've actually seen. Let's call it domestic violence. That's what it is. We don't want to minimize it. We want to call it out for what it is. It's mm -hmm. a crime. So in the couple of minutes we have left here, if an officer sees the clues that you've told them to look for, uh, what happens to help that person be safe? They can take them right out of there? Yes. Well, it's called the lethality assessment protocol now. And so they'll do an assessment right on the scene, even if it's not a domestic violence call, if they sense that there's that type of power and control going on. They'll talk to the victim alone, and they'll actually hand them a phone and say, I want you to call my friends at Safe Place right now. Wow. And so we're working together in the moment to help keep somebody safe. Well, we could talk about this probably for another hour, but uh, we're certainly glad for what you do. And uh, the Walk a Mile in Your Shoes event comes up a week from Saturday. Yes, check out our website, safeplaceshelter.org. It's a week from Saturday at Lakeview Square Mall. There's a 5K run for shelter first, and then there's the walk afterwards. So it's okay. just a couple hours of your morning, and again, it sends such a powerful message to our community and our survivors that we really hope 
uh, you know, to see everybody there. Say that website one more time, if you will. Safeplaceshelter.org. All right. Jennifer Fatma, thank you. Thank you. We'll talk again soon. 820.